Hello? Yes. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad you joined us this morning. I'm Pastor Susan, and I'm the family pastor. And I just wanted to let you know, um, most of you have probably seen our announcements that were played beforehand, but we want to highlight a couple of things. Due to the rain Friday, the prayer walk was canceled. I don't understand why we didn't want you out in the hail and the wind and everything. But, you know, it was canceled, but it has been rescheduled. The good news is it will be tonight at 7 p.m. And we will meet here and then the church, um, at the church to walk, pray, and to worship together with song. So we invite all of you to come and join us to the, here at the sanctuary for prayer. Now, due to that, our online Bible study will not be meeting tonight. But we do invite those of you who normally participate to join us in the prayer walk. We have been doing something called spiritual practices. I'm changing the name. I'm changing it to spiritual disciplines. And the reason I am doing that is if you Google or get on the Internet and look on spiritual practices, honestly, about 80% of them are not focusing on God, and they don't point you to God. So when I was in college and when I taught spiritual formation, we always used something um, from Richard Foster called uh, Celebration of the Disciplines. And what it did was it focused on the 12 spiritual disciplines, practices found within the Bible, which is what we've been doing. So we're going to continue, but we're actually just going to call them spiritual disciplines. And the one we are focusing on today is one of my favorites. It's celebrating. I, any, any chance I get to celebrate, I want to. And if you look through the Bible, Jesus celebrated a lot. That's one of the things the youth noticed um, Wednesday in our Bible study. It was just how his different demeanor, they noticed that he was a God of celebrations. In fact, in John 15, 11, it says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And as we got to thinking, it's like we as the Cornerstone family have a lot to celebrate. We have a lot to be joyful about. You know, um, we're meeting in person again. And that's a wonderful thing to celebrate. Okay, our kids got to go to school again. It was wonderful that our seniors, our juniors and seniors this year, they actually got to have a prom. Their dresses weren't just in their, you know, their suits just weren't in the closet. And they got to have an in-person graduation. We have had so many things. Oh, and vacations. We have a lot of people taking vacations. We have a lot of people going on trips to visit family members that they haven't seen for a while and everything. This is a thing to celebrate. And we've seen God work and people in our congregation and everything from heart attacks to strokes to different illnesses where God has blessed us. And we see them in the congregation with us. We, as a family, the Cornerstone family, have a lot to celebrate. So today, what we're going to have do is after the service, there is a table set up, and it says, Celebrate Cornerstone. And there is, because it is summer, lemonade and tea will be there. And we invite you to, after the service, to get a drink and to talk to one another and to share one another face-to-face, because -face, we can do that now, the reasons we have to celebrate this year. So, Lord, I thank you for the blessing that is the Cornerstone and our family here. And may we, as your words say, be overflowing with joy today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Cornerstone family. Now is the time. <laughs> Come on, now is the time to worship. Uh, is what it says in Psalms, and we're going to sing it here today. So feel free to stand with us this morning, and we're going to sing together. Come, now 
now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Just as you are before your. Jesus Messiah. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing Love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, man you were. Rescue for sinners, ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body, the bread, His blood, the wine. Broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. 
Jesus Messiah Name above all names Blessed Redeemer Man you will Rescue for sinners Ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. All our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue for sinners. Ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. This next song, God is Love, we uh, learned uh, a couple months ago. So if you remember it, help us sing along. How great this love. Oh, it's moving all my mountains. This perfect love. It's casting out my fear. How great this love. Oh, it welcomes me like family. And anywhere I go, it meets me there. And he is good. And he is God. What I earn not what I got and he is just yet oh so kind what I deserve it's not what I find what more could I say about him my God is love how great this love Oh, it's faithful through my failures, this trusted love is with me till the end. How great this love, oh, it's closer than a brother, this is love, he died so I could live, he is good. God, what I earn, it's not what I got. He is just and oh so kind. What I deserve, it's not what I find. What more could I say about him? My God is love. I know my God is love. I know my God is love. 
is love. This is enough to know my God is love. I know my God is love. I know my God is love. This is enough to know my God is love. I know my God is love. I know my God is love. This is enough to know my God is love. He is good. He is God. What I earn, it's not what I got. And He is just, yet oh so kind. What I deserve, it's not what I find. What more could I say about Him? My God is love. What more could I say about Him? My God is love. What more could I say about him? My God is love. Amen. Our hymn this morning is uh, Trust and Obey. Bring out the person that isn't just winging it up here. So, <laughs> hey, we're all winging it. <laughs> when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory that sheds on our way while we do His good will. He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay not a grief nor a loss not a frown nor a cross our best if we trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay for the favor He shows and the joy He bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey and you may be seated and kids can Go to Children's Church.
I make the second person that was running up here this morning. My goodness. <laughs> it's an active day. If you want to continue to be active, uh, please feel free to join us this evening for the prayer walk. That would be a wonderful thing and a wonderful time. I'm going to catch my breath. Whew. It's not a good sign when a 50-foot 50, 50 jog gets you out of breath. That's not a good idea. Well, hey, by the way, my name is Ben. If I haven't met you, I'm one of the pastors here. It is good that we are gathered and worshiping today. Uh, before I start off our sermon, uh, I just want to spend... Uh, I, I've got one more announcement, and then I want to spend some time in prayer. Uh, my announcement, uh, BPD, Ben Peterson Detailing, uh, is going to... Uh, we're going to have a little different hours than we thought we were uh, there's some uh, scheduling things going on with his helper, and he is. Uh, we're going to get that figured out this week, but be watching your email if you want to join us on Wednesdays to get your car detailed, uh, to, to give uh, Ben the chance to honk your horn and to do some good and fun things. So uh, be watching your emails if you want to join us for BPD this Wednesday. I want us to take a little bit of time praying. Uh, if you've been watching the news the last couple of days, you know that there was a pretty significant accident in our country with the, the collapse of the condo in Florida. So I just want us to respond to that. And just, we're, it's this weird juxtaposition, and we're always in that position as kingdom people where we realize that we are celebrating and we are hopeful, and we're even practicing celebration today like Pastor Susan was saying, and yet at the same time we acknowledge there is grief and loss in our country. And so let's just pray for a minute for the people of uh, Surfside, Florida, and let's go to God and ask God for, to be with them. Lord, first of all, be with us. Lord, we come to you, and we know you are good, and we know you are God, and you are more than anything that we can imagine. We thank you for that. We know you also as the God who suffers along with us, and we know your heart, God, is grieved by, by the tragedy of, of the uh, condos collapsing in Florida. We, we pray for, for them. We don't even know the words to say that, but God, we just ask you to intervene and to move. For the rescue crews that are working to try and locate people, for people that may be uh, still trapped, for people that have lost loved ones, for families that have been wounded by this tragic event, Lord, we, we ask you to move, to be present, to provide comfort. If there's a way for us to respond here in Topeka, Kansas, we welcome that. Lord, help us see that way. God, be with us this morning. Be with us so that we can hear your words. Uh, be with us because we know that you provide hope, that even in tragic situations, we know that following you still provides us with hope. Help us listen to you, Lord. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think I've told you all this before. I was a, uh, I was a football player in high school. Not quite as beefy as this guy. I was a uh, bit of a beanstalk in high school. Not very tall, but, but very, very thin. I was a 140-pound offensive lineman, uh, and that was... I was not the best. <laughs> if you know anything about football, the offensive line when, linemen, they're the ones that, you know, they're in charge of blocking, and uh, they're supposed to be these really big, strong, muscly people, and that was, uh, that was not me, but when your entire class is 16 people, uh, you don't have a choice. You get to participate, or there's nothing to participate in, uh, and, and so I played football, but, but our team came up with this great play. Uh, I thought it was a great play. I thought it was revolutionary. It wasn't. Every team has some sort of play like this. But, but essentially how it worked out was it was a tackle-eligible type of play. It was the type of play where the offensive lineman is an eligible wide receiver. Uh, the person on the other end steps down, and the offensive lineman is uncovered. And Anyways, there's technical football jargon. I was able to catch a pass. 
which was novel because I could see about 15 feet away from me. I didn't have LASIK then, and I desperately needed it. Uh, and I could see the ball about, uh, let's see, from the piano to me is about where I caught sight of the ball. And when it got about this close is where details came into picture. Uh, and, and that is why I was an offensive lineman. But it was going to be exciting I was going to be eligible. The quarterback was going to throw me the pass. The ball was going to travel like 10 feet in the air. That was it. I was going to catch it really quickly, uh, like within 10 feet of the quarterback. Easiest play ever. And it worked. Uh, the, the linebacker who was supposed to be guarding me didn't think I was going to be able to, like he didn't think I was running a route. And the safety in the corner, actually, I saw it on the game film later, they bumped into each other, slowed each other down enough that, I made a 40-yard touchdown, and it was great. Easiest play ever. We were going to win the game easy peasy. And then five plays later, I broke my leg, and my high school football career ended. <laughs> what we sometimes think of is going to be easy uh, doesn't always turn out that way, does it? Uh, we, we are in our scrolling series. We're actually in the last Sunday of our scrolling series, uh, next week, we're going to be moving on to something new, uh, something that was actually inspired by Dawn Zabel. Uh, Dawn, if you're listening to us, she listens to our sermons sometimes. Uh, but uh, Dawn actually uh, was talking about a book she was reading about women in the Bible, and I actually became a little convicted because I don't think I've spent much time talking about uh, women in the Bible that have amazing and good and wonderful things to teach us. So we're going to be spending the month of July uh, with some of the women we see in the Bible, taking a look at what they have to teach us. This is not just a four women series. This is for all of us, because all of us can learn from these women uh, that did godly and amazing things. But this is the last week that we are going to be in our scrolling series. And I wanted to wrap up with something that that I see so often in our culture, but we don't, we don't often name because it's, it's hiding, it's under the surface, it's under the radar. Uh, and it's not often spoken of or acknowledged, but, but it permeates the vast majority of things in our society. And it is this belief right here that life should be easy. Life should be easy. That's, that is what we are often told, even when our lived experience very much does not, uh, does not bear that out. But this idea that life should be easy, things should be easy, it, it's everywhere. I, I see it all the time in our culture and, and online. Have you ever seen those commercials that are like, you can easily make $10,000 a month if you just use our proven system. Or take these five pills and you'll get the dream body you've always wanted. Or even some of the low-key stuff that, is, that says, like, use this app for two minutes a day and your brain will improve, your IQ will go up 10 points. What, whatever it is, our culture places this premium on easy on things being easy, on getting to what we want in an easy fashion. Uh, and I think that's because we know if the, the check mark was marked hard, we, we wouldn't do things as often, right? Uh, that, that's the entire reason our culture invented drive throughs Somebody along the line said, you know what? You are asking me to get out of my car to get fast food, what am I, some sort of animal or barbarian? No, just toss it to me out the window in a greasy paper bag, and we'll go that way, right? That, that is what drive throughs are. We, we want things to be easy. Our culture wants that, and, and that... I think it has implications for a lot of things. It even has implications for us as as a church. Uh, th there are things, even personally, that I want to be easier. <laughs> I wish Caitlin and I's medical lives were easier. Uh, e even just some of the practical things. You know, when we've been doing the announcements uh, via video, uh, there's this little countdown clock that 
ticks over in this corner, that took an hour to make the first time. An entire hour. And then I didn't do it quite right, and so I had to redo the hour. Uh, and, and when Christy and I first started making those videos, it was like 30 minutes for you to make, and then 30 minutes for me to put it together, and then 30 minutes for it to process and render. And now what? Is it a 10-minute process? Five minutes for you? Five minutes for me? Easier is better there. I like that way more. It's a much better use of both of our times uh, when it's five minutes as opposed to half an hour. Uh, easier is not bad. If the same result can be achieved through easier effort, uh, unless there are other factors that are complicating things, we want that. But it's good to know that that is, it's good for us to know that that's what our culture desires in a lot of respects. And, and like I said, it affects even churches. Even just the fact that we have, we meet in a building with air conditioning. That's not how a majority of Christians in the world meet. Either they don't have a building, they're, they're meeting in other spaces, or they are meeting digitally. Uh, I think of the, the church in China, especially, have to meet digitally to provide anonymity to people. Uh, or, or they don't have air conditioning. Uh, they, they may not be able to put lyrics up on the screen. And those are things that we do to make coming to worship easier. That's not bad. I am not advocating that we turn the AC off today. Please do not hear me saying that. Uh, I'm, already, I'm already nervous that I chose a shirt that has white. I'm sweating a little bit already. We'll, we'll see how that goes. It, it is not bad for things to be easy. But we need to acknowledge that's what our culture expects. Our culture expects for things to be easy. And that's not our experience as we live in this world, and that's not my experience as I follow Jesus. So I'm going to invite us to turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 14. We're going to hear from Jesus a couple of times this morning. I, for whatever reason, I, I've found that Jesus' words were the ones that were most compelling in this area. But Luke chapter 14, you can turn there in your Bibles, on your phones, however it would be helpful. We're going to start at verse 25. Luke 14, verse 25. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Some pretty aggressive words there from Jesus, right? That's, that's pretty aggressive. There, there is more. Uh, there, this passage goes on, but I found myself focusing on these words most. So if you want to read and investigate more, uh, the following verses talk about builders that, that don't count the cost, and so they like build half a building and then just leave it and get made fun of. Or a king going to war with another king uh, figures out, no, he's only got half the army that the other guy has. Let's try and make peace here. Uh, those are the examples that Jesus gives but his message is, understand what you're getting into. Count the cost. Uh, this word, I'm leaving it up on the screen for those of us here. Uh, I, I like the NLT and how the NLT says things. Uh, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. I like the NLT's wording here. Let me just put another one up on the screen, a comparison. Uh, because other translations report the literal words. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother. Uh, and, and that's... Uh, the New Living Translation, NLT, just tends to be what I use because it, it helps us clue into some of this stuff. Jesus isn't asking us to hate our fathers and mothers or our spouses or, or uh, kids. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus doesn't ask us to hate uh, anyone. 
But what Jesus is saying here that the NLT says by comparison, uh, what he's saying here is that when you look at everything, your love for everyone should be good, but but your love for God, following God, following Jesus, that has to be at such a high level. It should be at such a high level that it feels like hate to everyone else, even though it isn't. That, that by comparison, your love for Jesus outstrips everything. It's got to be so strong that everything else is just very apparent to be in second place. Jesus is saying that following him, following the way of Jesus, moving in the kingdom of God, that's not the second type deal. That's not the second place thing in our lives. Our lives are oriented around God first. That our love for God has to be so massive and present that everything else feels just so far behind. And that has huge implications uh, for, for how we react to things like family that Jesus mentioned, um, uh, sports, politics, our, our culture at large. How we react to our culture is impacted by how much we are following and devoted to Jesus by comparison. And he says, yes, you must hate even your own life by comparison. Uh, The next line makes it clear. He says, uh, what does he say here? He says, and if you do not carry your own cross to follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Uh, Robert, I'm going to ask you real quick, could you lift the screen up for us just a little bit? Uh, When we hear this phrase, uh, carry your cross, what we we don't hear it like the first hearers, uh, the, the people that listened to Jesus would have heard it themselves. We, we see a cross like this and, and it's, it reminds us of Jesus. It's our focal point of worship that we remember what Jesus did for each and every one of us on the cross, that he died to save us, to reconnect us to God, to save us from sin, shame, and death. But the first people that would have heard Jesus' message here would have heard him say, take up your cross and follow after Jesus. They, they wouldn't have seen this, this cross behind me as a symbol of worship because in the first century, the, this, was, this was a terrible symbol. That, that was a symbol of, of war and power and death. Uh, it, it was this symbol of this utterly despicable evil group that was using their power to take over land after land. And if you messed with them, if you got out of line, death on a cross was going to be your punishment. It, it was... It was a horrible and painful death And Jesus said to his disciples well before he himself was crucified, before they thought that was even within the realm of possibility, he said, take up your cross and follow after me. If you follow me, make no mistake, you will be getting out of line with the world. That's what Jesus is saying. Expect persecution. Expect that things will not be easy. Expect that there will be opposition from human beings and from the enemy of our world, the Satan. Robert, you can put the screen back down. It it is expected when Jesus says, take up your cross to follow after me, it is expected that things will not be easy. And that often feels a little bit at odds with, uh, oh, excuse me there, with what we preach sometimes, or what we, how, not what we preach, but how we talk about what Jesus did for us, because it seems like the easiest thing of all. Accept Jesus, believe in what he did for you. Believe that Jesus for your sins, that Jesus came to give you grace and forgiveness and love, 
And if you believe and follow after Jesus, you will be saved. That's what we say, and that's what is true. And that seems easy. But you know, if you have been a follower of Jesus, it is hard to live out what Jesus tells us to every time. It's hard. It's not easy. And it's okay that it shouldn't be. Because we find that following Jesus, living the Jesus way, doing what Jesus calls us to is absolutely worth it. We, we know that following Jesus helps us to find peace, mercy, forgiveness, love, uh, grace, healing, belonging. Uh, when we follow Jesus, we, we recognize the God of the universe went through difficulty too, that the God who created everything came to die on a cross for us, that he went through the most difficult thing ahead of us. But he tells us, you're going to go through difficulty too. It is expected. Our world likes things easy. It does. It likes things to be easy, and our faith is not always easy. It's not a hobby. It's us as believers in Jesus picking up our crosses and following after him. And while we are usually not in a position to be, uh, to be persecuted like the early Christians were, uh, in, in the same manner, we recognize that following Jesus is not always easy and for the faint of heart. It is what we put our whole beings into. So all of that's kind of a downer, right? Is that fair to say, Nathan? A little bit? Yeah, that's hard. It's not easy. Uh, but if I can give you an encouraging word, and if I can give all of us an encouraging word after some pretty rough words of Jesus that, that aren't necessarily always feeling uplifting, the way of Jesus isn't always uh, the, the leave you happy and smiley at the end kind of thing. Sometimes Jesus has hard words for us. But if I can give you a word or two to encourage you and to lift your spirits, they'd be this, endure, persist. Be persistent. Now, I, I played my hand already. There, there are some kinds of persistence uh, that are not helpful. This kind of persistence is not helpful. This guy can push on this door all day. It's not going to budge. It's a pull door. He, he is doing the wrong thing here. That kind of persistence is not going to help anybody. And so if this is the kind of persistence we're aiming for, let, let's leave that uh, aside. But persist. Uh, Jesus says this in John uh, 16, 33. He says, I have told you all this so you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has already overcome the world, has already, uh, has already had his victory. We're just, we're just playing it out. We're, we're in the fourth quarter with a huge lead. It just doesn't feel like it. We, we know the outcome at the end. Our job is to persist, to endure right now because following Jesus is so worth it. Persistence is, uh, persistence is contrary to what our world is obsessed with. You know, there's, there's no product to buy to make things easier to persist in our, our faith journey. There's no life coach that can solve all of our spiritual problems. There's no fast pass subscription to, to get ahead in life, whether you're on a video game or you're in Disneyland. Disneyland fast passes. If you want to talk about how our culture is obsessed with easy, Disneyland fast passes. If you've never heard of it, blessed are you, you are you are in a better spot. If you want to get me going on a five-minute rant, talk to me after the service about Disneyland fast passes. But, but there's nothing for us to do to make things easier. We are called instead to persist, to endure. 
And I want to acknowledge that for some of us, that, that doesn't sound interesting. It doesn't sound interesting to endure uh, things, even things that are good, but, but that aren't easy, that are sometimes difficult as we follow Jesus. And I don't want to be in the position of deceiving anybody. The way of Jesus is not the easy path. Jesus calls us to do things that are good and incredible and meaningful, and they often require us to to give some of our time or our energy, our finances, our our spiritual uh, selves to a task. And the way of Jesus requires sacrifice of us in some way. And not everyone wants to do that. And, and I want to say, if, if that is you, I don't want to misrepresent the way of Jesus as easy. If that doesn't sound interesting to you, if you're somebody who is not sure that's what you want to do, I want to challenge you this week to find what is interesting to you. Because I think when you've had a chance to take a look at what the world has to offer, when, when you've fully looked into it and looked at it, you're not going to find the same purpose and meaning and joy even in the midst of difficulty that we find when we follow Jesus. I think you're going to come back and I think you're going to say Jesus is what we want to do and to be about with our lives. For others of us, we, we might uh, be a part of the Christian faith, the Christian tradition, and we, we want this faith to be something that we can easily do. Uh, you know, come to, come to church on Sunday morning and, uh, and that's, that's being a Christian, is, is showing up at church. And don't get me wrong, coming to church is good and wonderful and I love seeing every single one of you. Amen that we are here and that we are meeting and that we can see each other's smiling faces. That is good and great. But God often asks more of us. God often invites us Two more. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow after me. And I don't know what that might mean in your life. There are a lot of things that that could mean, and I'd encourage you to listen to God, to spend some time in prayer to see what God might be asking of you, teaching you. Uh, it might mean dusting off your Bible and, you know, taking, taking a look at this book on a day that isn't Sunday. Uh, taking a look, seeing what wisdom God has for you and for your life. Uh, it might mean uh, spending some time in prayer. Caitlin and I, uh, we, um, we like to do our prayer right before we fall asleep uh, at the end of the night to, to devote ourselves, uh, our rest to God and our next day to God, to thank God for what's gone on in the day and to, to devote the next day to Him. So maybe that'd be something for you to engage with. Maybe it would be as simple as waking up in the morning and saying, Holy Spirit, use me today. I don't know what step forward following after Jesus is going to be most useful in your life. You might try one of those three. You might have something else entirely. But take a step closer and see how worth it it is. And finally, there are... uh, There are some of us that, and I would guess this is many of us, that have been long-time followers of Jesus, that have have spent our lives following Jesus, persisting, enduring, and this is not the first sermon you've heard on endurance. This is not the 31st sermon you've heard on endurance. This is a topic that we talk about a lot because Jesus talked about it a lot. If you're somebody who's been following Jesus For a long time, praise God that you are enduring and that you are keeping moving. But if you're like me, sometimes it's helpful to have a reminder. I've been getting back into cycling lately. I've been enjoying that. Greg, you and I need to go sometime. I know we talk about it all the time. Maybe if I did more cycling, I wouldn't be winded running the 50 feet up to the stage. Uh, But I've been getting back into cycling and uh, been cycling on the Shunga Trail, and it's fun and it's good. Uh, I don't have to dodge traffic, just walkers. And uh, they're a little bit easier since I'm the faster-moving person there. But But I've been going on the Shunga Trail, and you know, you're pedaling. But when you're pedaling and you're going pretty fast, it's easy to, you know, oh, I'm going up a hill. Let me just slow down a little bit. And then you get to the top of the hill, and you're just kind of cruising. 
And you slow down some more. And what was a very aggressive, very fast pace all of a sudden becomes kind of a crawl. And, and you're just cruising. And you're not moving like you should. Uh, for me, I've got a little, uh, I've got this little box as I've been grabbing my handles. There's this little box right here that's my uh, speedometer. Uh, it's a constant reminder of, Ben, this is how fast you're going. And because I'm a little bit of a speed demon, I inherited that from my father. I always want to make that number go as fast as it can on the downhills. Uh, I've, I hit 24 miles an hour the other day. That was okay. I, I hit 30 in California. That's my goal. But, uh, but usually it's much less than that. Usually it's like 16, but, but all of a sudden, you know, it starts creeping down to 15 and a half. 15, 14, 12. And it's this visual reminder, then persist, endure, pick up the pace. And, I, and when I recognize that, I recognize, you know, I need to, I need to you know, get, get out of this cycle and get back, re-engage, get the fire back in my belly and push. And if you're somebody who has been enduring, that has been faithful, that has been persisting a long time, I want to encourage you to take a look at your heart and see if there's an area of your faith walk that you need to re-engage in, that, that you need a little bit of fire back in your life for. Uh, and if that's you, we're going to pray in just a second. I'm going to invite you to pray along with me that God would inspire and invigorate you so that we can all endure and persist. Uh, well, let me close by speaking a Bible verse over us. Again, the words of Jesus this week, they, they have just been uh, coming to me. Uh, uh, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, we're going to start at verse 9. I just want to read these words over you. It doesn't start out well, but, but wait till the end. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Friends, I, I want us to be the ones that endure to the end. That, that we will endure so that we will be called good and faithful servants of our Lord. So let's pray together and let's ask God to, um, to help us endure, to help us persist, to help keep us on the path of righteousness that he has laid out for us, that we can walk together. Let's pray. God Almighty, you are good and wonderful. We know that you call us to persist, to endure. You speak about it in many places. You, you tell us very much contrary to our culture that things will not be easy. But this is still the best way to live because we're following you. God, forgive us our, uh, our temptation to pursue what is easy instead of what is good. Help us mostly to follow you. God, whether we are people that aren't sure if we want to engage with you, if this life following you is going to be difficult, help us see you and see the glory and the goodness and the wonderful power your saving work did for all of us on the cross. God, if we are people that, uh, that want our faith to be easy, help us find steps towards you that will help us instead of looking for an easy way to live out our faith to instead look at the best way to live out our faith for you. And God, for those of us that have been faithfully enduring, Lord, I pray in a special way that you would reinvigorate our hearts with fire, that you would help us re-engage to get ourselves moving in such a way that people would just be able to look at us and know it is you at work. Because that's what we want, Lord. We want people to see you. Be with us. Help us engage with you. 
Help us move forward in faith and help us endure and persist until the end. We ask and we pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Friends, may you persist this week. May you not be satisfied with what is easy, but may you endure until the end so that you will be saved. Take care. Blessings to you. Go in peace.